first of all, I want to thank the organizers of this remarkable conference for giving me the opportunity to add my voice, an Italian voice, as you can hear, to such an outstanding pool of speakers. We are here to honor Charles Taylor and celebrate his achievements as a public intellectual, a philosopher of international standing, an original interpreter of modernity. But of course, most of us want to celebrate him, above all, as a teacher in the broadest sense of the term, someone who has taught us a lot of important things about life and work. I'm pretty sure the many, also many of his critics, would be willing to acknowledge Taylor's mastery, mastery in making the complexity of our experience as modern men and women accessible and in a sense plain. The ability to simplify a complex phenomenon without betraying its exper ex experiential density undoubtedly is an uncommon and precious intellectual gift. Not many are able to successfully combine thick descriptions and mild exercises and synopsis as Taylor is. In my talk, I'd like to concisely explain what I have learned from Taylor's writings from my special historical, biographical, cultural standpoint as an Italian born in the mid-60s, educated as weeping and turbulent transition, that a heretical and uncompromising thinker as Pierpaolo Pasolini came to describe as an anthropological mutation in his later essays. It was a quiet revolution indeed, whose true meaning we still struggle to understand. Like Belgium, Spain, Ireland, and of course Quebec, post-war Italy may be seen as a sort of laboratory of historical change. And Italy most of all. For my country's endless transition towards a full modernity has turned into a sort of sociological ideal type. As one of our most disillusioned social commentators, Giuseppe Prezzolini used to say, in Italia nulla è stabile fuorché il provvisorio. Nothing is more definitive than the temporary, we could say also transitionally in Italy. The result is a peculiar and interesting hybrid modernity that we contemplate with changing moods, sometimes with indulgence, sometimes with anger. It is like a delayed and downbeat version of Kozelek's Sattelzeit, Saddle Time, or Blumenberg's Epochenschwelle, epochal threshold, an accelerated slice of historical time when the, in quoting Blumenberg, cryptic border between the ages becomes somehow visible and can be personally experienced. In such cases, one has the impression to stand in front of a historical equivalent of a gestalt picture, a bestable image of one's own social and cultural environment that leaves one bewildered and baffled. What's of special interest here is precisely this disorientation in front of the historical flux, which tends to raise that kind of skeptical reaction we are all too familiar with in the modern philosophical landscape. What's real, what's illusory in this, uh, in this subjective experience of change? I wonder whether the same kind of radical doubt may be lying behind all the interest aroused by Fukuyama's much debated announcement about the end of history. Never as much as in the aftermath of a hectic process of modernization in the middle of a bourgeois entropy, to quote Pasolini again, the nature and motor of historical change can appear puzzling, even mysterious. Now, one thing that I learned from Taylor's sane attitude towards modern epistemological foundation, I mean, foundationally is not to be too afraid to embrace I'm quoting him, a hazy picture of history, where openness and order can coexist in the same optic as a guide for the perplexed. Our view must remain somewhat hazy because if we want to understand long-term historical change without resorting to an old-style philosophy of history, we have to do justice to different things. First of all, to historical discontinuity, regardless of and beyond the myth of an ineluctable and snowballing progress. Then, second, to historical continuity, without succumbing to the too easy and often premature fatalism of those who are unable to see, to see anything new under the sun. And last but not least, we have to be fair to our inescapable need for sense-making, 
That doesn't mean buying a necessary and rationally defined direction to the chain of historical transitions, as Hegel notoriously did. To cut a very long story short, I'm going to ask, how can we plausibly understand deep historical change, namely transitions, without denying or downplaying the intricate nature, its intricate nature? This is, in broad lines, the formula that I think might be abstracted from Tiller's writings over the years. I break it down in five steps. First, first step, we have to start from the reality of cultural mutation. The existence of historical change functions as the basic phenomenological given in this domain. Human history is the theater of changes in social discipline, social arrangements, and self-understanding, which bring <laughs> about new human possibilities, quoting Taylor. Second step, so first, the reality of cultural mutation. Second step, the first, this first-hand evidence or intuition of a contrast, however, is not self-explanatory, self-interpreting or self-authenticating, not at all. To be brought into focus, it must be put within a larger and increasingly more abstract and consequently controversial explanatory context. In other words, the phenomenological starting point works as a challenge to our prima facie grasp of difference. After all, change and diversity, although ubiquitous and conspicuous, don't speak for themselves. We have to resort to an ascend ascending, or if you want, abductive style of reasoning to tame the contrast. Making sense of a cultural mutation doesn't mean to project or absorb an overarching or majestic historical meaning. It rather consists in testing, probing, exploring a partially obscure and shifting sense of reality. And I'll get back to this point later. So third step. So the first problem facing an interpreter of long-term historical change is to plausibly accommodate a range of the familiar and the strange in her ascending articulation of the sensed contrast. To this aim, she has to devise a language of perspicuous contrast, a famous formula by Taylor, or to use a slightly different metaphor, a space of discordant reasons. Given that, to evoke a famous quip from Jean Renoir's La Regle du Jeu, in this world, the tragedy is that everyone has his own good reasons. This is a necessary precondition for answering the challenge from the intuition of contrast with a creative redescription of ourselves and others. Fourth step. The effort to put together very different things to perceive multiple forms in the same visual field is likely to produce, metaphorically, metaphorically speaking, a stereoscopic vision that both enlightens and confounds the mind. To dispel the confusion, it may be useful to understand the transition we're trying to make sense of as the gradual or sudden reconfiguration of a network of practices and of their respective imaginaries or frameworks. Following Kassirer, we can thus come to see that the character, I'm quoting Kassirer, of every culture rests on the equilibrium between the forces that give it form, and that a historical transition can be fruitful, fruitfully compared with a field change, even though the constituents are more or less the same, the outcome may be radically different. This shouldn't be too difficult to understand, since we often already experience some of our practices, existing practices as sources of change, in that they are the locus of strife and trouble and uncertainty. Think only of a basic social practice as parent to today, who could honestly claim that its point is obvious and shared by everybody in our society. Fifth and final step. To my eyes, at least, the underlying meaning of the previous steps is pretty clear and convincing. In order to compensate for the shortcomings of traditional philosophy of history and understanding the reality of long-term changes as stadial leaps or transitions, we have to find a way to combine history and anthropology. 
thick descriptions and mild synoptic efforts. In our best historical accounts, we should aim at bringing about a stereoscopic, multi-layered portrait of a cultural mutation that makes comparatively better sense than other interpretations or full-fledged explanations. As a result, historical transitions can be seen as cultural mutations, in some crucial cases, as genuine transitions between identities. The outcome of the transition is always somewhat precarious insofar as it consists of a configuration, field, or network of practices that carry within themselves a heavy load of history. To sum up the result of the previous discussion, we could use a slogan that Taylor himself resorted to in Sources of the Self, where he more than once speaks of an exercise or essay in retrieval to indicate what is involved in an adequate understanding of modernity. In a nutshell, we have to understand how we got where we are. To this end, as I suggested before, one has to attain a stereoscopic view by placing oneself in the historical in-between, what Blumenberg called the epochal threshold, or in other words, in the transition cusp, the cryptic border. Hmm? This means different things. Among else, it means escaping from the force field of common sense, opening up the closed world structures we inhabit, coming to see our form of life, what we previously felt as a limit, as one possibility among others, namely as a different take on our common humanity. Second, but the truth is that, as Taylor Riley notes in Sources of the Self, frequently we have to fight uphill to rediscover the obvious. For us, the retrieval effort is twofold. On the one hand, we have to struggle to refamiliarize with the agent's tacit knowledge, which has been sidelined and ostracized by modern mediational epistemology. On the other hand, we have to become contrastively acquainted with different and distant cultural horizons in order to develop, as far as possible, a reflective stance towards our common cultural background. To make my argument less abstract, I propose to take the story told in a secular age as an exemplary case study in a historical long-term transitions. In this book, Taylor is clearly albeit implicitly taking a stand on the controversial issue of whether a global, epical meaning can be ascribed to the so-called process of secularization, the alleged transition from a religion-centered community to a secular, immanent, exclusively human-centered age. His reasoning seems to me to proceed along the following lines. Something of import as change in religious matters in the West during the last centuries, so what I call intuition of contrast. This something has been increasingly interpreted in terms of disenchantment and political secularism, default framework of understanding. However, this description of the historical shift is far from obvious. There is room for competing, creative redescriptions of secularity. Taylor's proposal, as you know, is to focus on the changing conditions of belief. To this end, language of speaker's contrast is required as a background for a different narrative pattern, addition versus subtraction stories. The final outcome is a new self-understanding where our view of current core social practices drastically changes and the general meaning of the transition itself comes into doubt. Ample room is left for prospective judgments based on an assessment of the connection between the existing situation and the original paradigm shift. Metaphors abound in this domain. We can see the transition as a drift from the primeval source, as a hyperdevelopment, as an erosion, as an end of the thrust phase, and so on. What has been the response of professional historians to this way of understanding long-term historical change? Well, regarding a secular age, when there was reaction, 
It oscillated between vague, vague admiration and total refusal, self-assured condescension, and detached respect. But personally, what struck me most is the strong sense of misunderstanding, the uneasy feeling of being witness in a dialogue of the deaf. It's a bit as though they saw different things and lived in different worlds. So I want to conclude my presentation by interpreting such a prominent case of cross purposes as an unspoken and possibly undetected dispute on realism. What is real in the stories we tell about changes happening in such queer stuff as cultural backgrounds, religious imaginaries, moral frameworks, and so on. I find Taylor's recurring unpretentious definitions of reality in their seeming naivete a fitting remedy against the conceptual overload caused by modern epistemological anxieties to evoke McDowell's suggestive language. Here are a couple of eloquent examples taken from Taylor's writings, from sources of this. What better measure of reality do we have in human affairs than those terms which on critical reflection and after correction of the errors we can detect make the best sense of our lives? What a better measure. What is real is what you have to deal with, what won't go away just because it doesn't fit with your prejudice. By this token, what you can't help having a recourse to in life is real or as near to reality as you can get a grasp of at present. Very minimal, but convincing, at least to me, definition of reality. I understand these definitions as articulation of an Aristotelian insight that can be found among us in the, in the tenth book of the Nicomachean Ethics, Agar Pasidokeita Teina Ifamen, in the human moral affairs. What appears to all this we assert is real. In other words, what we usually have to cope with is not reality an sich, an alleged degree zero of reality, such as it could be accessed by a pure disembodied eye or a brain in a vat, but our sense of reality, what we recognize as reality. I would describe this view of reality, this variety of realism as a dynamic, practical, explorative, or if I may borrow another linguistic invention of Pasolini, a heretical empiricism. According to this view, the standard against which an ascription of reality has to be measured, assessed, cannot be an imaginary, brute, neutral, absolute fact. In an agent's world, there is no room for naked facts, but only for pre-interpreted, framed, seen as facts. These are real, but not immediately real. Reality always offers itself to animal minds under the guise of affordances that call for flexible, explorative, action-oriented, non-static or rigid responses. We experience the resistance of reality by testing and exploring it. This is our world, the praxeological field, to quote Bourdieu, that also precedes the distinction between subjective and objective. Going back to my main theme, what I mean to say is that since there are no historical transitions for a pure reasons I, it is easy but futile as any self-satisfied use of skeptical refutation to make fun of the ontological statues of queer things such as imaginaries, frames, backgrounds, practices, identities, fields, and so on. There are, on the contrary, very good reasons to consider real all that after a suitable reflective check cannot be removed from our best accounts of life experiences. So even epochal thresholds or sad old times and all the conceptual tools required to make sense of them can legitimately claim to be recognized as realities in the full sense of the word. And no overzealous distinction between historical, historiographic, narrative fact is required to bolster this insight. As there is a significant overlap between understanding historical transitions and appreciating the scope and potentiality of moral reasoning that, according to Taylor, is always a reasoning in transitions, so there is an important link between our historical consciousness and our moral and social ontology. 
As Anna Arendt used to say, reality is different from and more than the totality of facts and events, which anyhow is unassertainable. Who says what is, lege ta e onta, always tells a story. And in this story, the particular facts lose their contingency and acquire some humanly comprehensible meaning. This, at least for me, could be the last word on the question. However, such a seemingly harmless truth about the human condition and our sense of reality has to be continually reasserted, rearticulated, and argued for. And to this aim, a hedgehog's obstinacy is not only helpful, but essential. This is why the picture of a tireless, but enemy of all access warrior or fighter seems to me the best way to describe Charles' contribution to the, our ongoing conversation. So to pay tribute to his lifelong efforts, I conclude by borrowing the words used by Thomas Carlyle to honor a philosopher, Dougal Stewart, whom he esteemed at least as much as I admire Charles. He does not enter on the field to till it. He only encompasses it with fences, invites cultivators, and drives away intruders. Often, fallen on evil days, is reduced to long arguments with the passers-by to prove that it is a field that this so highly prized domain of his is in truth soil and substance, not clouds and shadows. Thank you very much.